Okay, this is Unit 3, Segment 3. Um, there's only four slides, so it'll be quick. Lots of definitions, however. So density current is going to be a current that is heavier, denser than the surrounding water, so therefore it will sink from the surface. You guys, so far up to this point, we've just talked about surface currents, you know, driven by wind, driven by um, <clears throat> Coriolis effect, and unequal heating, all of that stuff. But we have really have, we have not talked about the deep ocean currents. And there are two players in this game. We've got surface currents going on. They're tucked in tight to their little areas like the Atlantic Northern Hemisphere, a little circle of, of motion. And we have our Pacific Ocean Northern Hemisphere, a little circle of motion. But what you don't, what we haven't talked about is the fact that those currents are connected to the deep ocean in a bigger system. It's called the global conveyor belt, and so a density current is going to be the deep ocean part of that. And so that circulation is much slower than the surface. It takes 500 to 2,000 years before it will resurface. So we're talking very slow motion, but friends, it's connecting all of the oceans together. The surface currents weren't connecting all the oceans, were they? If you remember looking at the images and all of that, they weren't connecting you know, connected to each other necessarily, but with the bigger system that includes the density currents, it's all connecting all the oceans. So it's called the global conveyor belt, and you can see a picture of this on page 536, and you can bet that we'll be looking at that either with your reading questions or in class. Um, I am actually going to click on this. Okay, the images that you see on the left side, this is the global conveyor belt that I just mentioned. And you can see that there's the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean. All of these oceans are connected by this big, fat belt that moves very, very, very slow. But you can see these very um, cold density currents that are running along the bottom. You can see the direction of flow that they go. And then they come up here and swing in and warm up as they reach the surface, collecting energy. And they deliver that energy around the world. And then they drop down over here. So you can literally trace it with your finger um, in this broad path. Now, this is competing in some areas with the surface currents going on. Now, this map over here is only showing you surface currents. It's not showing you the deep ocean currents. So these are the things that are influenced by wind, Coriolis effect, um, unequal heating. I mean, all those things from that motion in the ocean lab are coming into play when you look at this map. But here, you have deep ocean in included. So these are two different ball games going on in the oceans, in the world. Um, and sometimes they can compete in the direction of flow that they're going. But this guy right here, the global conveyor belt, is much, much slower than the surface currents that you see over on this side. OK. Oh my goodness, sorry. Okay, the global conveyor belt is driven by gravity um, and density. And density, you know that there's two variables that impact density, and that is temperature and salinity. Thermo means temperature. Haline is also um, another name for salt. So we have temperature and salt-driven circulation. Temperature and salt are also the two factors that impact density. So we can easily say that the global conveyor belt is also called the thermal haline circulation and it is driven by density. <clears throat> it is a very efficient heat transporter. So if you're asked on a test, you know, what does the conveyor belt convey? The answer would be heat. Uh, it moves very, very slow compared to the surface currents like I showed you in that map. And the conveyor belt is critical. You guys, you saw some deep ocean images, and we talked a little bit about the deep ocean. Um, there cannot be life down in the deep ocean without oxygen. Everything alive respirates, everything. And respiration, cellular respiration, requires a gas, and that gas is oxygen. And so how in the world could we have abyssal creatures without any sun or anything for photosynthesis to take place? How can there be oxygen? And the answer is the global conveyor belt. When that water drops down, cold, it, there's oxygen at the surface. And when that water drops down, cold water will retain 
that dissolves those dissolved gases more than warm water. So the cold water lacking that energy will keep the the dissolved oxygen trapped. So that way the abyssal organisms actually get oxygen. The movement of the conveyor belt, you saw it rise up and sink down in certain areas. So this movement is vertical and horizontal. Okay, the other, there's a benchmark that um, wants you to look at ocean and atmosphere interactions. How the ocean, what role it plays in climate. And you can kind of see in this climate map right here, um, if you were to hold it side by side to a current map, and if not, um, you can kind of see here that the Gulf Stream brings warm water up and over and delivers some of that heat up to the British Isles. We've talked about that before. So the British Isles here um, are actually warmer than what they should be. See, if you look over here, this is subarctic. This is, this is tundra frozen, yet over here at the same latitude, it is warmer, and that's because of that heat energy being delivered by the currents. So if the ocean currents were not connected to climate at all, you would actually have this to be frozen. This would be all frozen right there. Um, there's a other cu couple other connections here. We have warm currents coming down and around. They travel this direction in the southern hemisphere, and so it's bringing that heat over here, making it tropical and wet. All right, and then we have cold. It losing energy, it's cold, and it's um, potentially dry, and so we have this area right here that's arid, dry. And <clears throat> you can find a couple other examples there too. Maritime versus continental climates. Maritime means um, along the ocean, along the coast. And then continental means landlocked. So if you live along the coast, you actually benefit from the fact that the water retains some energy. Um, whereas land, think of yourself on the beach. You have sand that will absorb the heat energy from the sun and it can get very, very hot to the point where it can even burn, burn your feet. That sand gets hot quickly. And then at nighttime, that sand is cold. So it, it, it absorbs energy quickly and it also releases energy quickly. That is land. That would be your continental doing that. Water or the ocean, think of that beach again, South Haven, you got water. During the day, you go into the water and it might feel a little chilly or warm, it just depends. In the evening, it feels the same. The temperature never changed, and that's because water can retain the energy. It can, it can hold on to that energy. It takes a long time for water to actually um, heat up, change temperature, or cool down. It takes a long time for that, so not just a day. We're not talking about a day like we were talking about with sand. So if you live along the edges, the coastline, you're going to benefit from the fact that that water can retain some of that energy. We even, we even have a little bit of, um, you can see a little bit of that effect with our Great Lakes. If you look at South Haven temperatures in the winter versus South Haven temp versus Portage temperatures in the winter, Portage is actually colder than South Haven. And that's because some of that energy, um, it gets trapped in the atmosphere right above the, the Great Lake and the westerlies blow it across, and so um, South Haven is actually more mild. It's not as cold in the winter. It's actually not as hot in the summer either because that energy can be absorbed by the, by the water. So continentals have more extremes. The continental climates are more extreme in their winter and summer, and then maritimes are less extreme. Oh, I don't mean to do that. Okay, your last slide is just making a connection with the carbon cycle. So the ocean is actually a huge carbon sink. It's a reservoir that stores carbon, and it stores it in two ways. The phytoplankton can take it up through photosynthesis, so they take up the carbon dioxide, they store it in their um, body tissues, or it can just dissolve, the carbon dioxide can just dissolve into the water, and that's what most usually happens. Now what we're seeing is a problem, and we've talked about this before, ocean acidification. With carbon dioxide being mixed into the water, carbon dioxide mixes with water and makes carbonic acid. Therefore, it's decreasing the pH, making it more acidic. And this, this is problematic because we're seeing an increase in the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. We'll talk more about this in the next unit of climate change. But um, there's more in the atmosphere. There's more now in the ocean as well. And the coral reefs and the shelled organisms have that calcium carbonate 
making up their skeletons and their shells. And that, my friends, is organic limestone and it dissolves in the presence of an acid. So our coral reefs are dissolving. Our shelled organisms are, their, their shells are becoming thinner. So it's really problematic um, and it's, unfortunately, it's um, what we're seeing in our, in our coral reef areas. And now we're done. We're done with this unit. Um, this is the last segment. Cheers.